slowly descend that 77 foot flagpole, 450 feet up in the air. They light it at 6 o'clock at night, and it is lowered beginning at 1159. There are two 300 watt bulbs, one at the top and one at the bottom. Years and years ago, they blew off dynamite here, and then when electricity came into vogue, they switched over to electricity. And as you can see, the crossroads of the world is armed there and ready to go with a mighty big celebration. In the spring of 1995, in the small town of Bedford, New York, just an hour north of Times Square, two mothers were organizing against the local school district. The way Marianne Debari and Seal Demazi see it, wrote the New York Times that year, the devil arrived in Bedford, liked what he saw, and settled in. Good evening, I'm Hugh Downs. And I'm Barbara Walters, and this is 2020. Four years prior, ABC's flagship investigative journalism program, 2020, took an unusual step into the darkness and the previously unseen. Tonight, in a two-part report, we will show you an actual exorcism. And nothing like this has ever been seen on American television. I now exercise you most unclean spirit. You gave power to your apostles to pass through dangers unharmed. The program was sensational. I can attack your evil spirit in confidence and security. It scared the world. Become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. In 1985, CBS's 60 Minutes aired an equally sensational program on the evils of tabletop RPGs. You're role playing, you're rehearsing, you're developing the character hour after hour, day after day. We're really talking about intense violence, intense involvement in a very uh, serious form of violence. Interviewed alongside phony psychiatrist Thomas Radecki here was Patricia Pulling, a grieving mother who lost her son to suicide and claimed that his involvement with Dungeons and Dragons was the primary motivation. It was obvious through his writings that he felt he had assumed this character. The story was reminiscent of perhaps the most notorious case of the decade, one about a boy who disappeared into the steam tunnels under Michigan State University in August of 1979. Private investigator William Deere caught wind of the case, hurried over to Lansing to help the police with his finding, then theorized that Dungeons and Dragons could have been cause for Egbert's erratic behavior. A year after his disappearance, the boy shot himself. The tension is mounting. 1995 is around the corner. You'll tell. When the ball hits the bottom, it'll light up and say it. Let me wish you a happy new year early. Nice to have you with us. Dr. Bruce Dennis was the superintendent of Bedford Central School District in the spring of 1995. He was battling the accusations of two mothers who claimed that his teachers were promoting witchcraft in the occult, death worship, and Satanism. They pointed to a handful of trading cards as evidence of their claims, and accused a growing game company out of Northwest Washington of being the harbinger of evil. Marianne Dabari and Seal Denotzi declared that Magic the Gathering was a gateway to the occult. It was blasphemous and dangerous for their children's minds. And after criticizing Dr. Bruce Dennis of violating the students' First Amendment rights to worship freely and without intimidation, they took the school district to court. The devil had arrived in Bedford, liked what he saw, and settled in. The year was 1995. Magic was booming in popularity all over the country. Wizards of the Coast would soon print its billionth card, and Black Lotus hit $100 on the secondary market for the first time. Inquest issue number one was sold to game stores and comic book shops, and the first officially sanctioned release event would take place in mid-October in New York City. They called it The Gathering. The event booklet handed out to players was tattered and brown, and depicted the image of a sorcerer on its cover. Out of context, it could have been mistaken for a very different type of event, a witchcraft convention or a guide to casting spells. Magic's IP looked a lot like this event book in 1995. With just a couple of base sets and a few expansions in production, Wizards of the Coast was still in its infancy in establishing the game's visual identity. 
The first thousand cards or so, the same ones circulating in the Bedford School District, offered a general theme of high fantasy that held the pieces together. There was cohesion at the macro level. But woven in alongside imaginary beasts and faraway lands were depictions of religious oppression, ancient mysticism, and a heavy presence of witchcraft. Even the name, Magic the Gathering, it had an undertone to it. The back of the cards were also driving this feeling. The five colors arranged in a pentagonal shape had a presence all their own, and it scared people. They warned us about it when we were in school, something about the role-playing nature of it, and the dice were evil, and people would have these parties and be up all night, and they they had us scared to death of D&D. And looking back, I just feel so dumb. using the five you know, elements geez. of witchcraft. Remember the, the Pythagorean solids? Those were represents. Five elements of witchcraft right there. I don't, I've never played the game. I'm not familiar with the game, but I hear echoes of what we heard back in the, uh, the 80s about D&D uh, with a game called Magic. Are you familiar with it? Magic the Gathering. These five colors, which defined the core essence of the game, had origins not in the occult, but in the pages of a book. I had this idea for a trading card game, and it took me a while to maybe six months before I came up with a framework for magic. But that framework itself was taken from games I've been designing all through the 80s. And this five colors concept was throughout them. I think the first place came about, there was a book called The Master of the Five Magics. This book, published in 1980, was a recurrent source of inspiration for Dr. Richard Garfield's games. But parents in 1995 weren't reading high fantasy novels. They were watching exorcisms on television and hearing stories about rituals in the nearby woods. Stories about animal sacrifice and the summoning of demons. Roaming in the shadows were covens of witches, emerging to worship the changing season of late October. Now, suddenly, these same witches were being romanticized in the illustrations of their children's playing cards. There's two different communities that use this park. Uh, one is the uh, pagan or occultic community, and the other community is, of course, the homosexual community. Interestingly enough, uh, they go hand in hand. Upon entering the park, I mean, you can see they've already got started. This is a pentacle. The interesting thing about this pentacle is it's an upright pentacle. This is not a satanic pentacle. The pentacle and pentagram were present on early magic cards, and so was its inverted counterpart. The symbol dates back 5,000 years to the Greeks who used it as an emblem of perfection. It also passed through early Christianity and decorated the architecture of some of the older cathedrals. In pagan practices, the pentagram, like in Magic the Gathering, is a representation of the five elements. It has spiritual value. But in the 1960s, the symbol was conflated with the recently established Church of Satan and a rise in serial killer murders, marking the beginning of a new era and the birth of a reactionary cultural panic. Now, in order to separate the sensationalism from the sacred for my story, I wanted to speak with a practicing witch. So I called one. Uh, my name is Peg Aloy. I'm a film and television critic. I'm a former professor of media studies. I also work as a gardener, and I also work as a baker. I've been a practicing witch for about 35 years. I was curious about why these two parents in New York were so scared of magic cards and pointed to witchcraft as the source of their worries. I learned that their paranoia was an echo of a phenomenon that dated back decades to something called the satanic panic. Those of us who are products of the 70s, 80s, and early 90s remember similar warnings about the devil's influence in pop culture. It was a time of fear. It was the season of the witch, now affectionately referred to as the satanic panic. The satanic panic, which for want of a better description is, I don't like the H word, but I'm going to use it. This is, it was a sort of mass hysteria that occurred that had to do with people thinking that there were devil worshippers and witches who were kidnapping babies or who were brainwashing young people and impregnating them and forcing them to bear children and then those babies were then being sacrificed to Satan. Pegaloy told me that the protesting of the Vietnam War, the Charles Manson murders, and the production of Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby in 1968 marked the origins of the Maelstrom. There was this idea that there were all these things that were corrupting the young people in America. The hippie counterculture, with its admiration for nature and community, had witchy overtones in its messages, 
and the rise of heavy metal out of England harmonized perfectly with the attitude of many young people who resisted the constraints of conservative right-wing America. The satanic panic originated in the late 60s, flourished in the 70s with the scapegoat of Dungeons and Dragons, then solidified its message in the heart and minds of terrified suburbanites with TV programs like televangelist Pat Robertson and the 700 Club throughout the 1980s. Something that's against the status quo is somehow evil. And witchcraft was the perfect sort of target for that, that, that really famous quote by Pat Robertson about women, when women get liberated, then they start becoming lesbians and practicing witchcraft and, you know, all that. From the New York Times, once again. Magic the Gathering is steeped in the hidden language, imagery, signs, and rites of at least 30 satanic cults in this country, Mrs. Dabari said. Moreover, it is a codification of the beliefs, practices, and perceptions of the new Satanists of today. There are inducements in Magic the Gathering to engage in destructive, cruel cult practices. So, where is all this black magic? Perhaps Seal Denotzi and Marianne Dabari were looking at Burnt Offering, a spooky image of a wicker man engulfed in flames that recalled another witchy cult film from 1973. They certainly would have seen Dark Ritual, which, as the name suggests, meant that playing magic was itself a ceremony. Cards like Lord of the Pit and Nettling Imp struck a nerve for their quote, lurid depictions of demons, end quote. Sacrifice also appeared in the lawsuit many times and honestly stood no chance in the eyes of these parents. And of course, the witchcraft depicted on cards like Lashrak's Sigil and Circle of Protection Blue were further proof of Wizards of the Coast's subliminal messaging. There's that pesky pentacle again. In browsing all of the cards printed up until 1995, I found more and more examples of the same imagery and themes targeted by the Satanic Panic. So many of these cards could have doubled as album artwork for the metal bands who were being taken to court for backmasking lyrics. Even the more nonchalant cards like Fumarole and Energy Storm had a dark, unnerving quality to them. My name is Eric Landis. I've been a Magic player off and on since the beginning. I wanted to talk to my friend Eric Landis for two reasons. The first, he was playing Dungeons and Dragons throughout the years of the Satanic Panic, and subsequently found magic in an enchantingly cool way. Peter Atkinson was my GM before he founded Wizards of the Coast. We had, we had role-played when I was in college. After I left college, I started working at Microsoft, and one day I just got this packet in the mail, and it was an alpha starter box and two beta booster packs. And he's like, hey, we've got this new game, check it out. In middle school and high school, we played AD&D, first edition, yeah, there was definitely a stigma. I distinctly remember a conversation with my mother. I was brought up Catholic. She was an administrative assistant and organist in the church. So the Catholic church was an integral part of our family life. I had been playing D&D with some friends. This would have been around 79, 80. And she asked me, what do you do when you play? She just, you know, she, she wanted it from me. She wanted me to describe what our game sessions were like. Because the fear going around at the time, you know, you're conjuring demons and you're you're casting spells, you're actually doing this stuff. And I explained to her, you know, it's it's cooperative storytelling is what it is. This was probably an hour conversation. And she's like, okay, I believe you. And that was the last I heard of it. That was a direct result of what was going on with the satanic panic and her perception being kind of a church insider of sorts, where she just needed to know. I also wanted to ask about his role as a parent to two kids who took interest in magic very young. And we were packing to move, and I still had some of my old cards and boxes in the garage. And so I was going through them to see if there was anything worth selling. And both of my kids, in fact, my daughter was more interested than Jack was at first. So I put together a mono red deck and a mono green deck, and they just took to it. Eric told me that he never had any preoccupations with showing his youngsters that witchy old card game. In fact, the early exposure to magic left quite a devilish impression on Eric's son, Jack. He was seven when he started playing. To this day, Desecration Demon is his favorite card. How real is devil worship? Well, that's what my next guest will inform us. First, we have Dark Lord Blood. Those two parents in New York weren't the only ones afraid of magic in 1995. 
Peter Adkisson and his small team at Wizards of the Coast were also apprehensive of the game's gigantic success in a sort of Frankenstein's monster type of way. They knew that the lawsuit against the Bedford School District could put magic in the crosshairs of television talk shows and ruin the company before it could fully find its footing. Furthermore, Wizards had not yet purchased Dungeons & Dragons from TSR. That would come two years later in 1997. But if another satanic panic took over the country against these witchy and demonic trading cards, then certainly that would have marked the death of a business venture. So they nipped the fear in the bud with two tangible changes. The first was an aesthetic one. That inverted pentacle behind Unholy Strength was erased for its 4th edition printing, creating an incoherence between art and flavor. As a result, the 5th edition version of Unholy Strength received new artwork entirely, and has never returned to Schuller's original depiction since. The second change was relatively minor, but it marked a shift in philosophy for world building and the Magic brand. In 1995, the team removed demons from the game and replaced them with a more neutral creature type in horror. It was a small camouflage that, hopefully, could keep the worried parents at bay. Video games would soon enough do the heavy lifting in that regard. But to me, this change had ripple effects that we still feel in Magic today. Looking at the expansion starting in 1996, you get the sense that Magic had found its identity in high fantasy and began to move away from world history as a source for storytelling. The Weatherlight crew would soon arrive and give shape to the game's first big heroes and villains, marking them by name on their own cards and in the pages of their own novels. Their popularity would lay the conceptual framework for Planeswalkers, which, alongside traveling to new worlds every year, became the most defining feature of the brand. Now, with the omnipresence of comic book heroes and media and new Marvel movies every year, the zeitgeist has fully embraced superheroes as a cultural staple. These interests used to belong only to nerd culture, and now they're the pillars of the mainstream. Magic sits in this space. It is the culture. But in 1995, Magic was still decidedly counterculture. It was heavy metal. It was witchcraft. And it was scary. <laughs> Much of Pegaloy's research is concerned with the depictions of witches and the occult in popular media. So I wanted to hear her thoughts on some early magic cards that exist in this space and illustrate some of her own personal practices. I absolutely love incense. In fact, I used to work at an occult shop in Boston where we sold a lot of um, ingredients for making incense. I sold my own line of it at festivals for a while. I actually started writing a book about witchcraft and incense. I think that when you see a representation of it in film or TV, there's this the smoke having a physical look to it. So if you choose ingredients that create that thick smoke, you know, that can be kind of cool. But the, it's, it's not just that it looks interesting, it's that one thing you can do with that smoke is you can visualize magical intention. It's sort of like scrying where you use a crystal ball or a dark mirror or a, or a bowl of water. Smoke is also a surface upon which you can um, visualize something or you can project your intention or imprint your intention upon it. Karma is another card that has historical resonance not just in East Asian religions, but also in the Wiccan Rule of Three, which is a principle that states that whatever energy you put into the world will turn to you threefold. This goes for both beneficial magic and hexes. I, I love this. this. This actually really reminds me a bit more of a tarot card. It does feel like this is a witch character. It has almost a vibe of one of these kind of old hag witches that lives, you know, by the edge of the forest. Uh, the purple, of course, that's a semiotic signpost that says this person's a witch or a wizard. The, the color purple uh, is associated with magic and the occult, you know, frequently. It's also associated with death uh, and, and royalty. So we do see this um, color purple associated with, with witches a lot and returning to that pesky pentacle once more. So back in the 80s when, you know, where people were, were starting to explore witchcraft, or whatever, you kind of knew that you were serious about what you were doing if you were willing to wear a pentacle front and center out in public. A lot of people couldn't wear them out publicly because, you know, they had to keep that part of their lives private. They were fearful of losing their jobs 
or they didn't want friends to know or they didn't want their parents to know or whatever. In fact, we didn't talk about the fact that I was one of the co-founders of The Witch's Voice, which was a, an international sort of networking and news website that um, was founded in 1997. We started as a nonprofit organization in order to help people who were having these kinds of legal issues with you know, having the custody of their children put into question or were losing their jobs or they were facing harassment in their communities because of their beliefs in witchcraft and paganism. Having to hide from public chagrin is a feeling I think many people in geek culture will find relatable. And it brings me to my final point for this video. The moral panic in the United States, and to a lesser extent in Australia and France, directed against RPGs, especially Dungeons and Dragons, originated in the media response to the suicides of 16-year-old college sophomore James Dallas Egbert III in August 1980 and 16-year-old high school student Irving Bink Pulling II in June 1982. Patricia Pulling, mother of Bink Pulling, attempted to sue TSR, the manufacturer of Dungeons and Dragons, for the death of her son. Pulling linked her belief that there was satanic influence behind RPGs to three other perceived threats to the social order, heavy metal music, the pagan revival, and the satanic ritual abuse scare. Every year around Halloween, articles and videos emerge from popular websites tallying up the scariest magic cards ever printed. Quoting Dr. Thomas Radecki, M.D., a psychiatrist at the University of Illinois School of Medicine, the evidence in these cases is really quite impressive. There is no doubt in my mind that the game Dungeons & Dragons is causing young men to kill themselves and others. The game is one of non-stop combat and violence. It is clear to me that this game is desensitizing players to violence and also causing an increased tendency to violent behavior. When people speak to you over the phone and speak to you and you introduce yourself as Dr. Radecki, do you think they have the right to know that you've lost your license? I think they, uh, certainly I would tell people that if they asked. Appearing often in these lists are grotesque cards showing macabre torture and violence, and imagery of dead things come to life. Ms. Dabari said she and Ms. Danazi formed concerned parents, citizens, and professionals against the seduction of children in February after they found out that their children were playing a popular trading card game, Magic the Gathering, in an after-school program. If you ask what's wrong with it, then you must not have seen it, Ms. Dabari said. It's inherently damaging and dangerous. It's baffling why any adult would let their child near it. There are images on the cards of Leviathan and Satan with the demon pentagram on on his forehead. It's easy to find these kinds of cards, though. They're everywhere, in every set, and have been since the game's inception. To me, the scariest cards in Magic's history come from one set, a small run of just 122 cards, widely available in America as the ball dropped on January 1st, 1995. People talk about the witching hour being sort of like midnight. In fact, it can be any, any number of times of day. But dusk and twilight are very important times of attunement uh, for modern witches in terms of meditation and what have you. Twilight, when things are beginning to get dark, when your vision starts to play tricks on you. I mean, this is when you start seeing things that aren't necessarily there. The scariest magic set ever printed could never be printed again. It doesn't fit the brand anymore. But it helps us understand so much of the culture of the late 1990s and the fear that permeated through social circles of worried parents. In The Dark, we find all forms of reactionary behavior to the misunderstood, from burning people at the stake to belittling them for living in caves, an ongoing stigma for the citizens of Matera, Italy today. We see the exorcist just like America saw him on nighttime TV in 1990, and in the 70s in the silver screen adaptation of William Peter Blatty's novel. We see the aftermath of floodwaters and the depression of losing the little land and property one can own. We see its elemental opposite, too, a striking image reminiscent of recent events. We see the witch in her contemporary state, and we see her hunter. The Dark offers a snapshot of human violence driven by fear, with an historical point of reference for nearly every card present. The dark is chilling because the elements of fantasy feel more decorative than foundational. It's a somber and haunting collection of cards that, like the name suggests, feel the weight of human history. Here is the last card that I showed Pegaloy. The story of the witch in all cultures 
is the story of the woman who ages, you know, the woman who outlives her fertile cycle and then sort of the culture has to decide what to do with her. Wow, yeah, no, this, this, this picture just opens up everything for me. This is just um, the witch as part of the world and why we have to have the witch in our belief system. The witch helps us make sense of what we fear and what we don't understand, not just in the world, but also in ourselves. So if we can kind of, we can leave our bodies and go out into the world and see it in a whole new way, you know, that's kind of what the witch invites us to do. This episode is brought to you by CardKingdom.com. Go to cardkingdom.com slash studies to pick up magic cards, spooky and otherwise, for the holiday season. I'd like to thank my three guests on this episode. The first is Pegaloy at The Media Witch on Twitter. You can find links to her articles in the description below. She is brilliant, and I'm very grateful she got to be part of this, and I really appreciate her insight. The second is Eric Landis, who is a co-host of the One Man is Short podcast, and you can find him on Twitter at Proggy Boog. Eric, thank you for sharing your personal experiences with the game. And finally, I'd like to thank Aaron Campbell for providing an excellent narration of the articles and quotes. I love Aaron's voice, and I thought she would be perfect for this episode. You can find her on Twitter at Original Estrus. Thank you to the Dredge Queen. Finally, you can support me by going to risticstudies.com or patreon.com slash risticstudies if you enjoyed this episode. I'm selling mugs on my shop. These are the last run. They will be gone before the end of the year. And you can use coupon code WITCH for free shipping. Thank you so much for watching, as always.